Well, as you can see from the slide I'm about to share, um, our 10-week study is actually entitled A New Start on Your January Health Goals, because probably the number one New Year's goal for most people is to lose weight. And nutrition is so much more than just weight. It also involves exercise and temperance and air and like quality sunshine and water. So that's why we're using this acronym New Start. N is for nutrition, E is for exercise, W is for water, S is for sunshine, T is for temperance, A is for air, R is for rest, and most importantly, T is for time with God. So fitness is not just about nutrition, although that's a big part of it. There's so many other aspects to living a quality life, and that's why we're going to take these next 10 weeks or so to kind of go through that. The acronym New Start actually comes from Weimar Institute. Um, it's an acronym that they use in their health program. We're not using their health program. We're only borrowing the acronym to kind of keep it going. But if you want to check out their programs, it's called Weimar Institute out in California, and they have a lot of excellent health-based programs. So we're just going to go with a quick reading out of Ministry of Healing, one of the books that has really changed my attitude on health. And this is kind of where Adventists and even a lot of Christians get their ideas about the laws of health. She says, pure air, sunlight, abstinence, I probably said that wrong, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. Every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. So when this was written in the 1860s, like many people were already recognizing that health was much more than just what you eat. It actually involved many other aspects as well. And that's what we'd like to go through during this 10 week study. So we're gonna start with N for nutrition. Basically, I'll start with a little intro and then we're gonna have a lot of cross references. We're gonna have a lot of discussion questions. So you're welcome to talk as much or as little as you like. Um, but to start with, I'm just gonna give a quick little intro on nutrition. As you can see from these facts and statistics on the right hand of the page, nutrition is a big, big moneymaker here in America. Um, according to this, and this statistic is from 2006, so this was already quite a while ago, 13 million people binge eat. And honestly, it's probably a lot more. Those are just the ones that openly admitted to it. About 10 million women battle anorexia or bulimia. And that's not just common to women. One million men, you know, I even know men that battle both of those as well. And because we're in such a food-saturated society, um, sometimes while the rest of the world might be struggling to get enough food, we have an overabundance of food. And this is actually negatively impacting our nutrition. Um, even in 2006, $40 billion a year were spent on dieting. And we can quite frankly say it's much more now. So we live in a society that is surrounded by food, that has food everywhere we go. So we want to learn tonight, what does the Bible say about nutrition? What does the Bible say like our attitude toward this should be? And what are some practical things we can do to maximize our nutrition? Because nutrition isn't the only reason why a lot of America is obese. Um, yes, it can come from what you eat, but there's actually other environmental factors. There's psychological factors. There's a family history. There's medications. There's a lot of things that are impacting our nutrition more so than food. But tonight, we're going to focus mainly on food. And there's a lot of other reasons why maybe we're struggling with obesity. I just included this because I thought you might find it interesting. But ever since aspartame was approved for food, the obesity rates have skyrocketed. Now, like the previous slide, there's a lot of other reasons why we may be struggling with obesity and an overweight crisis. But one of the reasons may be aspartame. And I just found this incredibly interesting. And that's why I included this. And I'll send it out to you later. But regardless of why we may overeat, undereat, binge eat, be obsessed with food, maybe be neurotic, or maybe we might have some food-related illnesses. Maybe we're getting sick a lot. Maybe we're getting coughing or sneezing. Maybe we have a lot of allergies. All of this might possibly be food-related. So we're going to go back to the Bible and see what does the Bible have to say about the original diet. So if you'd like to grab your Bibles, um, we're going to go right to the first book, Genesis, written by Moses. About um, It was written probably about, 50, I think it's about 3,500 years or so. Like it was written when he was in the wilderness for those 40 years. And since then, although diets have come and gone, we can see that the biblical diet is always the best. So if someone could read Genesis 1. 
Um, we are going to start in verse 19. So Genesis 1, verse 19. And I am sorry, I actually put 19 and it should be 29. So if someone could read Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, and then we'll talk about what the original diet was. Genesis 1, 29 and 30. I can read it. 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for me, and it was so. Thank you. So how would you guys describe the original diet? What stands out to you from Genesis chapter 1? Vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Vegetarian. Now, for some people, they're like, oh, that sounds good. And other people are like, oh, that sounds really disgusting. <laughs> but that was God's original plan. And it's interesting when we look here, we can see that he gave fruits, nuts, and grains. But it actually wasn't until after the fall that vegetables were given because they were eating of the tree of life. So there was actually no need for the nutrients that were in the vegetables. And we're actually going to see that from Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. This is where part of the curse actually involved eating food intended for animals. So if someone could read Genesis 3.17, we're going to explore that a little bit more. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Curse is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And Jeff, do you mind reading verse 18 too? Sure. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Ah. I'm not sure I want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so all those vegetables that maybe children have hated for generations, that actually wasn't part of God's original diet plan. It was the sweeter, the fattier fruits, nuts, and grains, those that taste really delicious. And they were eating the tree of life at this point. But of course, in Genesis chapter three, after they sinned, they couldn't eat from that tree of life anymore. And it's interesting that one of the curses is actually eating of all the plants that were intended for animals, the plants of the ground. So what are your guys' thoughts on this? Like, do you have a different understanding of that? Um, what are your thoughts on the original diet? Hmm. We certainly wouldn't have a lot of the health problems that we have today if we had stayed by that. Yeah. I found it interesting that the original diet was easy. There wasn't much food prep at all. Pluck it right off the tree, eat it. I don't know what they did with the grains. Maybe they sprouted them. Maybe they could eat some of those grains raw. I'm not quite sure. But you know, nuts and fruits, those are certainly very, very easy to eat. And God encouraged them to eat freely of these. And of course, later on in scripture, he did give permission to eat meat. He did do that after the flood. Um, but he was fairly specific in only eating clean animals. Leviticus 11 and other books of the law also distinguish between clean and unclean animals. And Jesus himself did eat meat. But the only meats we have record of Jesus eating were actually lamb and fish. Like Jesus never ate any unclean meats. And as a poor carpenter, he probably didn't have meat every day. Those were probably just reserved for feast days. So because if you look at what poor people ate in Jesus's time, it was mainly a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, a lot of oils, and a lot of breads because those were the cheap foods. So this study that we're about to have is not meant to force anyone to be vegan, not at all. But um, scientifically, there's a lot of proof that plant-based living actually has optimal results. So we're just going to look at what does that look like and what are some practical takeaways. So there's a lot of different food pyramids here. You can see that even though both of these are plant-based, um, there's a little differentiation between what should be at the bottom. On the right-hand side, um, the creators of that felt that grains should take up the majority of your diet, while on the left-hand side, they felt that it should be fruits and vegetables. 
The great thing about eating plant-based is you really don't have to count your calories. You don't really have to measure it out in cupfuls. I honestly don't know how many servings of grains or vegetables or fruits I get every day, but God encouraged us to eat freely of these. And if you're eating freely of them and abstaining from things that are bad from you, you're probably not going to have too many health problems, if any at all. So we know that from Genesis 1 and 3 that the original food plan was a plant-based diet, but this is how many calories we as a nation consume and where we get these calories from. Technically, according to Genesis, it should be 100% plant food, but really here in America, we're only getting about 12% from plant food. 63% is processed food. Processed foods have been known repeatedly to cause different types of cancers and health complications. And Granted, I eat them. We just got over the holidays. I overindulged in many things. So I'm not here to like point fingers at anyone, but this is just to look at what God's plan was and how we've deviated from it. So plant foods, unfortunately, only take up about 12% of our diet. The majority is processed foods. And then the remaining comes from animal foods, meat, dairy, eggs, things of that nature. So clearly, in general, we as a nation have a lot to go back to, and the Bible is a great book to go back to, to take away some of these principles in our own lives. And if we look at the foods that God created, it's amazing how so many of them resemble the body parts that they help. I wear glasses. Clearly, I didn't eat enough carrots. But when I was younger, they always said, eat carrots for your eyes. And if you look at a carrot and your eye, they literally do look very similar. Walnuts are probably one of the best nuts. And ironically, they look like your brain. Ginger, whenever you have upset stomach, people might encourage you to have like a ginger tea or put some ginger in your smoothie. A lot of Asians use it as a palate cleanser. Well, that's because ginger kind of looks like your stomach and it's actually good for your stomach. Kidney beans are good for your kidney beans. Tomatoes look like your heart. So it's phenomenal how God created all these foods and they actually look like the body parts that they best help. If you live out a plant-based diet, there's so many benefits to this. Number one, it lowers the risk of heart disease. It lowers the risk of chronic diseases. It reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes. It improves digestion and gut health. It improves overall nutritional intake. And it's growing in the U.S. So I know that 20 years ago, maybe veganism wasn't as popular. But now, no matter what restaurant you go to, for the most part, you're going to find some good options. Uh, people don't look down on it like they used to, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So I have a few more things I want to show you. And then we have a lot of discussion questions. As we talked about, our health study is focused on New Start with every letter representing an aspect of our health. So nutrition, in a nutshell, if you eat natural foods in their natural form, that is optimal for your health. Because not only is it going to help your physical body, it's actually going to help your mental well-being as well. My favorite book on this is Councils on Diet and Health by Ellen White. And more recently, a lot of studies have come out on those that eat naturally and those that don't. And according to Science Daily, it says people that eat fast foods are 51% more likely to be depressed. This is the reason why I stopped eating Taco Bell. In my 20s, I could eat it a few times a week, no issues at all. After I turned 30, it's like my body didn't digest it anymore. And I would have this like wave of depression when I ate it. And I thought maybe it was because it was making me feel fat or maybe I couldn't digest it. But after I read like the intricacies of the study here, it makes logical sense. I was eating it like two times a week. And I was noticing that it was only on those days that I was having mental fatigue, that I was kind of depressed, that I was a little sluggish. And that was directly correlated to the fast food that I was eating. Minimally processed foods decreases your anxiety, while processed foods actually will increase it. They did a lot of new studies during COVID. You can check out one of the links underneath that. Processed food takes a lot more energy to digest. So if you're anxious and have all that nervous energy, processed food is not going to help that. And if you specifically struggle with anxiety, the four foods that are horrible for that are alcohol, caffeine, sugar, and refined carbs. So even if you're not plant-based, even if you're not vegan, just cutting out the alcohol, cutting out the caffeine, cutting out the sugar or the refined carbs will have a great improvement in your mental health because God actually designed foods to reduce your anxiety as we looked at that previous chart. 
So this is a video here. If you're a visual person, if you like to see what people eat and what they suggest, this is a nutritionist who was featured on a local television show. And it's really short. It's only a few minutes, but she's going to give us some practical tips on how to eat to maximize our mental health. So here we go. Are the colder temperatures and time change giving you the blues? If so, registered dietitian and nutritionist Roxana Asani of Giant Foods is here to talk about which foods to eat more of to help with stress, anxiety, and depression. Roxana, good to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good. So we hear about these all the time, but who knew, I didn't, that they can really help with stress and um, happiness. Yeah, so good news is that all these foods right here will boost those neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine, which are the feel-good neurotransmitters in your brain. Mm -hmm. So you'll feel good and happy. Yeah, and you said a study was done recently that proves this. Yes. Yeah, so a study out of New Zealand found that people who ate more fruits and vegetables felt calmer, more energetic, and happier. Mm. So you really want to fill up on those fruits and vegetables. All right. Let's start with these vegetables. So the first group of fruits and vegetables that we have right here are full of tryptophan. And tryptophan is really known for boosting the serotonin in your brain. Mm -hmm. That's the happy chemical. Yes, yeah. exactly. And here we have our dark leafy greens. And they contain folate and magnesium, which is also really essential for producing that dopamine and serotonin. Mm -hmm. And an example here, you've got what, some chard? Mm-hmm. Some kale, kale. Some collards, any dark leafy green, and even things like Brussels sprouts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we have our fruits and vegetables that are rich in vitamin C. Mm -hmm. So vitamin C is really known for reducing that stress hormone, cortisol. So you want to fill up on these citrus. You could do berries. You could do things like kiwis or even yams mm -hmm. would work. A ga glass of uh, orange OJ doesn't just do the job? We really want you to get it from Whole Foods, but yeah. you could also do a glass of orange OJ. Okay. Like. All right. And so... Um, what do we have here? So moving on, a lot of people know that omega-3 rich foods are good for heart health, but right. they don't know it's also really good for brain health. Mm -hmm. So you want to try to incorporate two to three servings a week of these omega-3 rich foods. Okay. So you can get it in the form of fatty fish like salmon, tuna, or sardines. Okay. You could also get it from nuts and seeds, so things like pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, or even flax. Avocado. Is that an omega-3? That's a monounsaturated fat, okay. but you could also incorporate that as okay. well. And so what are these different seeds that we have here? We've got pumpkin. Pumpkin. Seeds? Okay. Mm -hmm. Chia seeds, walnuts, and flax seeds. And I know these two, chia and pumpkin. Uh, flax seeds, you can just kind of throw that into some cereal. Yep. You could really yep. incorporate it into a lot of different things. All right. And let's okay. talk about this. Fermented. I found this pretty interesting. Had no idea. Yeah. So um, you really want to fill up on those uh, fermented foods because a lot of people don't know that our gut produces 95% of our serotonin. Mm. So filling up on things like kefir, kombucha, kombucha. Goat, or even things like sauerkraut or kimchi, mm. you could incorporate as well. Mm -hmm. All right, and this is everyone's favorite yeah. here. I mean, chocolate, right? Exactly. So our favorite food, um, it's really good news because science have, has found that it really reduces your stress hormone cortisol. Mm -hmm. The only catch is it needs to be dark chocolate right. and watch your portion size. Yeah, so no uh, milk chocolate, you know, all that good stuff. Yeah. No Snickers bars. <laughs> so try to stick to dark. So if you um, have any, if you have any more questions for a nutritionist, you can find find one of us at giantfood.com and click on wellness to find a nutritionist closest to you. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much, Roxanne. For the colder. So some of the food she mentioned you can see on the screen here, and dark chocolate, like she said, you know. Just be careful with that because it has a lot of fat, it has a lot of sugar, so that can actually increase stress and anxiety. So if you just watch your portion size or get it as natural as you possibly can. Um, carrots, my brother gave me a good rule of thumb. He said the darker the color, the better it is for you, the more antioxidants it has. So now whenever I buy apples, I get the darkest possible apple. Or when I get greens, I get the darkest greens. Even when I get onions, I try to go with red onion rather than white onion. So easy tip is just get the darkest possible fruit because generally those have the most antioxidants in it. And a lot of those healing properties are actually in the peels. So particularly if you buy organic, it's okay. Eat those peels for the most part. Don't throw them away. You can put them in a smoothie like if you don't really like the taste, but those are actually really healthy for you as well. So eating natural foods can be fun. It can be easy. Here are some ideas on the screen here. I could eat oatmeal every day. I've probably been eating it for multiple decades and I'm still not sick of it. Um, I also like, as you look on the right-hand side, you know, like an Asian bowl, a poke bowl. Um, all of that is super easy food. Like both of these, you could easily make in about five minutes. So my question for you, because I want to hear from you what works for you guys. What do you do to make healthy eating easy? 
And question number two, do you have any time-saving or money-saving tips? So if you could share with the rest of us, we want to know what do you personally do and what do you recommend for us? Well, I have one. Uh, you can grow your own tomatoes. They're organic and um, delicious. Even in a pot. What? Even in a pot. pot. Oh, yes. Even in a pot. I grow mine in a raised bed. And they're free. <laughs> Is there a certain type that grows better than others, do you think? I really don't know what I'm growing. Um, I love if I buy tomatoes. I buy the heirloom tomatoes because they taste better, but um, the ones from my garden taste very good. They're called Wisconsin tomatoes <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, a friend of ours, a neighbor, brings them down from Wisconsin and we plant them. <laughs> I like to cook uh, dried beans rather than eat beans out of a can, even that though that might be easier. It's fun to have them fresh. Mm -hmm. Do you soak them for a night before in salt water? Yeah, or you can uh, boil them. Uh, and uh, after you, you bring them to a boil, uh, let them set for an hour. It's the same thing. OK. I had read somewhere, that's why a lot of people, they don't eat beans because they have a lot of, you know, gas and things like that. But apparently that's because all those lectins aren't being soaked off. So if you do dried beans, which I do probably a pound or two a week, it makes a lot. So for like a dollar or so, you can get a big bag of beans, one pound, any type of bean you want. Like Elaine said, like Jeff said, soak it. Um, I like to soak it for 24 hours. I haven't done it with salt water, but now that you said, I'm going to start doing that. And then rinse it off real well. And I personally like an old-fashioned crock pot. For some reason, the flavor seems to be better. It seems to be cooked better since it's over a period of time. And once I'm done cooking, one pound of beans makes an entire crock pot. And then you can share it. You can freeze it. Um, beans, you could put in like Mexican dishes. You can put them in some like Middle Eastern, you know, Lebanese, um, Syrian dishes. You can make Boston baked beans. Um, if you want to put some beans in your smoothie, just use the white beans because they pretty much have no flavor, but you're going to get a lot of protein in your smoothie. So mm -hmm. that was a great tip, Elaine and Lisa. Um, beans, tomatoes, they're good for your kidneys. They're good for your heart. Um, does anybody else have any other tips? Um, what do you like to do? And do you have anything that saves time or anything that saves money? I like to make white rice and put black beans on it. Oh, okay. That's good. Just had that yeah. last night. Yeah. And I love chia seeds. I pour those in a lot I of things. With cheese on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just thought that. Mm -hmm. All right. Nutritional yeast is, is something that I use a lot versus rice. It's healthier <laughs> for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I hope this changes over time, but my wife, Lisa, sometimes described herself as cheap. And I say, no, she's just frugal. Mm -hmm. But when we go to the grocery store, we are both willing to pay a premium for organic food because we feel that's important to our health. And it's a trade-off that one makes. And there's other areas one may cut, but um, we don't cut when it comes to organic food. Mm -hmm. Actually, she's got me even reading labels now. <laughs> and what I've started doing, it's probably not as good as buying organic. I think I just need to bite the bullet and be like fully committed. But um, I've for stuff that I buy that might not be organic, I've been soaking it in vinegar. And supposedly it's supposed to help like take off some of the coating. But I don't know. Like Jeff and Lisa, do you think, is that just like... Is that a wives' tale? Like, does vinegar really work? Do you think, or not really? I, I read that food grade hydrogen peroxide. You okay. can get a brand. You can get food grade hydrogen peroxide and put some of that in the water and soak your vegetables and fruits before you eat them. Okay. That will kill bacteria and what have you. Okay. But you okay. dilute it. You don't use it full strength. It'll burn you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you get it at a health food store. Yeah. 
Okay. Shokum and what? Excuse me? Shokum and what? And uh, that, um, oh. what did he say? If, if there's some fresh vegetables or fruit, Lisa will put them in water, but she'll put a little bit of food grade oh. hydrogen peroxide, which is about a 30% concentration. 35%, but now I guess they've changed the laws on shipping and they had to reduce it to 34% because it was considered kind of a dangerous okay. material to ship for some reason. Res yeah. Hydrogen peroxide over the counter is that's 3%. only three yeah. percent. Yeah. So, but you get it on your hand; it'll burn. You all yeah. of a sudden you'll start feeling this. Your skin turns white and it starts to burn. But it goes away. You wash <laughs> your hand, and in a few minutes, it yeah. goes away. The point is, it's just diluted. Yeah. It's not full strength. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it'll cook your food for you. <laughs> <laughs> So not only are plant-based foods of their natural forms proven repeatedly to help your health, um, there's actually the added benefit of eating your meals early on in the day. Um, I read a few different studies. It tracked people that ate the same amount of calories, but the people that ate those calories before 3 p.m. were at least 20 pounds thinner than the people that ate those calories huh. after 3 p.m. And Ooh. granted, there could be other factors involved as well. But I think from a common sense standpoint, it does make sense to like push your meals earlier. I'm not saying it has to be three o'clock. That's just the meal time they chose. But I know like in my personal life, if I eat heavy and go to sleep, I have almost like these hallucinatory dreams. Like I don't sleep well, I'm sweating, like I'm very fitful. And then when I wake up, I'm not really energized. Normally I wake up right away. I exercise and have my worship. But like if I eat late the night before, that is not going to happen. So Traditionally, for thousands of years, people ate generally about two times a day, and they would eat like a mid-morning meal, and then they would eat an evening meal, and there would be several hours before they went to bed. Mm -hmm. And that's done for a variety of reasons. Not only is it cost-effective, because you're really only eating two times a day, but you're also eating earlier. So you want your stomach to be emptied by the time you go to bed, because then your body can focus on going to sleep and on healing. Like you don't want your body focusing on digesting food while you're sleeping. They also connected it to your mental health. Um, people that eat a nutrient rich breakfast experience less anxiety. Um, for much of my life, I skipped breakfast, particularly in college, because like, I'm like, I'm not hungry. Why should I eat? Well, I wasn't hungry because I was eating late at night. And once I flipped that and I eat heavier in the morning and lighter in the evening, it made a major difference in multitude of areas. Um, Ellen White talks a little bit about this in her book, Education. Um, she is not dogmatic about what time you eat or about how many meals you eat. She does recommend, in most cases, two meals, because quite frankly, we don't need all the calories that we're being given on a daily basis. But she said, if you are going to eat a third meal, try to take it a little earlier. Try to eat foods that are easily digestible so that it's not just sitting in your stomach when you're trying to go to sleep. Late night eating has been shown to make it harder to lose weight. Even if you're eating the exact same foods, if you just switch your time and try to eat them earlier in the day or before you exercise, or maybe even go on a walk after you eat, that's going to help counteract some of that. Because if you're eating late at night and going to sleep, we all know what's happening to that food. It also can damage your metabolic health. It can affect your memory and your concentration levels. It can lead to disturbed dreams, and it can increase your acid reflux. So late night eating, for the most part, we know it's not that good for us. Sometimes we probably do it because we might be at someone else's house. But for the most part, if you're trying to eat plant-based foods and you're trying to push those meals a little bit earlier, you'll probably notice a lot of great results in your own life. And this is where the term health reform comes in. For some people, they think it's a curse. The minute they hear health reform, they get angry and they get hostile. And it's probably because sometimes certain segments of the church have forced it upon other people. And that was not Ellen White's intention at all. She actually received a lot of dreams from God about what we should be eating, how we should be eating, when we should be eating. And even she at first didn't want to do what God was recommending because it went contrary to everything she had been taught. But once she started doing it, she said she lost 25 pounds of flesh. The only thing she did was change her diet. And as life went on, she made more and more changes. She wrote about these changes in books like Ministry of Healing, Councils on Diet and Health, a little bit in the book Education. 
And this is a really powerful quote from one of her books, Councils on Diet and Food. So if someone would be willing to read the quote, and then we'll talk about the three questions at the bottom. I'll read it. If we close our eyes to the light for fear we shall see our wrongs, which we are unwilling to forsake, our sins are not lessened, but increased. Oh, so it was a good reminder for me because sometimes I don't want to hear truth and I need truth. So there's also another really important quote on this right-hand side here. It says, oops, it was in love that our heavenly father sent the light of health reform to guard against the evils that result from unrestrained indulgence of appetite. So God gave us this original diet because he loves us and because he wants us to have this amazing life. So three questions here. Number one, why is health reform so important? Number two, what should our attitude be toward making changes in our diets? And number three, how was health reform a blessing, not a curse? So if anyone would like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Well, I think health reform is so important because in a prior slide, when you point out that, what was it, 50 or 60% of the diet is processed foods with sugar, yeah. fat, and uh, other additives. Um, and ever since that's happened, our health as a country has deteriorated. Yeah. And some people feel this goes back to what was the doctor's name in Minneapolis? Um, that was the, you know, no fat. Um, Atkins, at, was it? At, no, no, that's, anyway, there was, in, in the 50s, somebody uh, promoted the, you know, no eggs, low fat, et cetera. And what happened is the food industry, as a result, had to do something to, quote, sweeten the taste of processed foods, and they put sugar in it or high fructose corn syrup. So by eliminating uh, the salt and, and the uh, fat content, some of which is good for you, they just ended up getting replaced by sugars, which was a worse sin than originally with some of the fats. A brain needs so much healthy fat to, right. to metabolize and do its work also on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And what fats are those? Nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to get them from nuts and avocados, olives. Those are like my my personal favorite top three fat sources. And honestly, in my own personal life, it wasn't until I started heeding the counsels from Ellen White that I started noticing like permanent results in my health. Like prior to this, like I grew up, like my generation was like so neurotic about weight. Like the more your ribs showed, the better it was. Like you reached your goals. And like, it really took a long time to undo that because if you're like perpetually under eating, you're only one step away from overeating. So it's like kind of like a rocky roller coaster, like my teens and my twenties. And it really wasn't until my thirties that I actually started doing what Ellen White said. All these years I had been resistant to it. And it was amazing how quickly I saw results, whether it was physical or mental or emotional. And I'm not saying that like I heed her advice all the time. There's about probably 95% of the time I'm on it. There is about 5% of the time that maybe I'm indulging in foods I shouldn't eat, or maybe I'm eating too much. But for the most part, those instances are farther and farther and fewer and fewer. And there's been so many drastic blessings that I've received from health reform. So it's actually a blessing, not a curse. She didn't hit people over the head. We're not supposed to do that either. But we shouldn't ignore her writings because she reminds us that if we close our eyes because we don't want to know, we're actually increasing our sin rather than decreasing it. Amen. And there's a powerful sermon by this man. He's a pastor called Randy Skeet. R-A-N-D-Y-S-K-E-E-T-E. -E -E. He's from Barbados, powerful, powerful preacher. And when I was 33, I had some brain surgery. I was in the hospital for one month, and then I was in um, inpatient rehab for another month. And as I said, I came from a generation that was obsessed with weight. So besides all the pain I was going through, my number two concern was, am I going to get fat? Because I was bedridden. I couldn't move. I they had to put like safety alarms on the bed. 
and I was on steroids. So my appetite was like greatly increased and heightened. And it was actually this sermon that really opened up my eyes to the spiritual importance of appetite, how it's not just something that you treat for aesthetic purposes. Like you actually have to watch what you eat and drink to the honor and glory of God. I love this sermon. It's really great. And I'll send you guys the link afterwards. But he reminds us that health is connected to the great controversy for our souls. Adam and Eve sinned through the indulgence of appetite. They wanted that shiny piece of fruit, that one piece of fruit they shouldn't have had, and they ate it. But Daniel and his friends, they were victorious over appetite. When Nebuchadnezzar was throwing alcohol and all these foods their way, they refused to eat it because they knew it was a sin against God. It's interesting that when Jesus fought the devil in Matthew chapter 4, his first battle was over the issue of appetite. So it's interesting how this is a common theme throughout scripture. And if you go to the seven churches of Revelation, the first promise is to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We lost our privilege because we indulged our appetite. But when we get to heaven, once again, we will be able to eat from that tree. And he goes through a lot more reasons about how what we eat and drink actually matters to God because he loves us so much. And this is a repeat quote from the previous screen, but it really opened up my eyes to the beautiful spiritual blessings of diet. It's not just about not being fat or not being obese. It's actually about having mental clarity, about sleeping better, about being better self-controlled. It's about having better Bible and Bible quality time, about being able to memorize scripture. All of these things are actually related to what you eat and what you drink. So the two questions I have is, why is it important that we recognize the spiritual importance of healthy eating? And number two, what are some of the spiritual benefits that you experience from a healthy diet? So if anyone would like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Why is it important what we eat and drink? Why does that matter to God? And what are some of the spiritual benefits that you've received? Well, I think like in uh, Daniel, when, when you purpose in your heart to follow God's health laws, he gives you increased understanding of prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, that you're, I mean, really in all things, they were wiser than, than the wise men of Babylon. But especially Daniel had all wisdom and knowledge in visions and dreams. And, and that's what we want. We want to understand the, those visions and dreams that he had. And so shouldn't we be adopting the same diet that, that led God to bless him to have that understanding? Yeah, hello? Great. Oh, yes. What were you saying, Rick? Yeah, I, I think it's important that um, we recognize the spiritual importance of eating healthy because we're being obedient. To what the Bible's telling us to do. Anytime we're obedient to the word of God is with when we're doing the right thing. When we go against that, <laughs> that's when we get the opposite. You know, we reap what we sow, you know. Amen. I think also, Ashley, as we've seen on some prior slides and have heard from other studies, the interrelationship between eating healthy, the physical diet, and emotional strength. Um, we talked about anxiety and depression. Um, I think if you have the two combined, they're going to leverage each other, and you're going to feel better and have the discipline and probably the initiative to uh, eat healthier. Mm -hmm. I think another thing, too, is... Uh... You know, the, the latest science on gut health it really mm -hmm. focuses on the health of our microbiome. Right. Bacteria in our gut. And they're dramatically altered or shifted based on what we're eating. If we're eating different types of food, different types of bacteria will populate our gut. And our, our, our gut actually acts almost like a second brain. There's as many nerves in your gut as there is in your brain, and there's a direct connection between them. And uh, a lot of neurotransmitters are actually produced by bacteria in the gut. 
And if you don't have that type of bacteria, then you're not going to have that neurotransmitter and, and your brain literally is not going to work as well. And so there's actually some dramatic consequences, not just in your, you know, what we more think of more physical aspects of our health because of eating, but it, it definitely affects our mental health as well. Lisa, you've indicated a lot of autoimmune and other diseases actually start in the gut, which is piggyback on That's what I've read, yeah. And on uh, Phil's comment. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. And I, I won't go over all the things on the sides. I'll actually email this out to you later. I always like to have extra so that if we don't get to it, you can read it on your own. But these are some powerful quotes from Ellen White because a lot of times people get overwhelmed. Like maybe they've struggled with healthy eating their entire life, or maybe they're a binge eater, or maybe they have anorexia or bulimia, or maybe they don't have any of that, but they just can't eat healthy. Like they always go back to those processed foods. Well, Ellen White reminds us that there is hope for us. And in a multitude of her writings, she reminds us that Jesus actually already fought the battle on appetite and we can be victorious just like he was. So I hope you get to check these out. I will send them out to you later. I went to a variety of different websites to see like, how do people actually make this practical? Um, a lot of women, for some reason, it seems to be like more of a women's activity, but if this works for you, you can do it as well. But um, these are like flashcards they made with like different Bible verses when they feel like overeating or when they feel like eating foods that are not good for them. They'll either memorize these Bible verses or they'll have them like posted on their refrigerator or like anywhere throughout their house. Um, this was another website that had made some beautiful flashcards here. So I'll send it out to you. Not only can these apply to like what you eat and drink, this could actually apply to other passions, to other struggles that we all have. And turning over a new leaf doesn't have to be this long, laborsome process. Sometimes the hardest part about making a new habit is just making the decision to stop. Because it wasn't until I actually realized there was a problem that I was able to actually move past that point and to be victorious over an area that I had really struggled with. So it's not popular to acknowledge that there's a problem. We live in a society where everybody wants to think everything's okay, come as you are, there's nothing wrong with you. But if we look at what we eat and drink and we realize there's a problem, just acknowledging there's a problem between us and God and asking God for forgiveness. That could be different for each and every one of us. Some of you may not have that issue at all. Some of us, like myself in the past, like my husband and I, we've eaten too much before. When we were young and we first dated, like we would have one cheat day a week and we just get pizza and we just like plow through that pizza and then that would be it for the week. And then we'd go back to our regimented eating. But God doesn't want us to eat like that. That's not healthy. That's not good for your brain, for your gut. And asking God for forgiveness to move past that. Remembering that we can't do it by yourself, but by faith, we can live in the spirit, not the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 reminds us of that. And I love Romans 13, 14. It reminds us to make no provision for the flesh. So whatever your struggle may be, if it's alcohol, if it's sugar, if it's fried foods, if it's eating late at night, we all have different things that might not be so good for us. Um, realizing what your trigger is, what your stress is, and what your struggle is so that you can make a plan to not be around it or to, if you are tempted by it, have an alternate plan so that you can walk away. Um, these are just few quick things that have been helpful to me or to some of my friends. Um, if you're trying to get healthier this New Year's, maybe you can check out intermittent fasting or maybe gradual transitions or lastly, maybe the Daniel fast. And I'm going to run through them real quick and I'll send them out to you to look at them at your leisure. But intermittent fasting is really popular, but quite frankly, it's been around for thousands of years. It basically means don't eat all day. It means like eat at set times and then have a break. That's why it's called breakfast because it breaks the fast. But nowadays we live in a society that has three meals a day, multiple snacks and late night eating. So our stomachs are never really getting a rest. So intermittent fasting just says, I'm only going to eat at certain times. Literally millions of people have utilized this. They've lost weight. They've gotten rid of their diabetes. They've cured certain diseases. You can see all different types of benefits on the screen, which I will send out to you after this. And there's so many different ways you can intermittent fast. Um, the easiest way you can see is number four on the screen. Basically eat for 16 hours out of that day and then let those other eight hours give yourself an empty stomach. Don't eat anything during those eight. Excuse me, I flipped that. 
there should be eight hours where you're eating and 16 hours where there's nothing in your stomach. Um, some people do one meal a day. I have a friend that does this. She has really good success with that. Other people fast one day, they fast two days a week. But quite frankly, as you can see from the screen on the left, the easiest way to do this is for eight hours, eat where you're gonna eat. So if you eat at six o'clock a.m., and then maybe have your last meal at 2 p.m. And then don't eat outside of those windows. Or if you have your first meal at 10 o'clock, maybe then you're not going to be eating until you won't be eating after 4 p.m. A lot of people have really good results with this. And because you're not eating all the time, you're actually going to reap a lot of the results and a lot of the benefits that were mentioned on this previous screen. For some people that might be too extreme, they might not be interested. That's fine. Um, Shakira like recommended this, not this particular slide, but she had brought up the concept before. Um, just make gradual transitions. Maybe if you're eating too much sugar or maybe too much meat or maybe too much dairy, maybe start with eating it twice a week and then once a week and then once every two weeks and then once a month. So for some people, it's hard to go cold turkey. So you could take whatever you're struggling with it and plug it into this chart and it will just help you like reduce it gradually so that you can make it a lifelong habit. And lastly, this tends to be my approach to things is if it was good for Daniel for 10 days it, or for 21 days, it should be good for me for an entire lifetime. So I don't always do the Daniel fast, but I would say the majority of the time I do. And for me, this has greatly brought in a lot of results and a lot of um, mental well-being to my own personal life. In the book of Daniel, the first part of Daniel, Daniel and his friends, they just ate natural foods for 10 days. And then they were 10 times wiser than everyone else in the nation. Later on, Daniel wanted to be able to um, interpret a vision, to interpret a dream. He wanted special understanding from God. And he went through a time where he didn't have any fancy foods, so to say. It was very, very natural foods. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, beans. Um, he didn't have honey. He didn't have processed foods. He didn't have meats. It was a very, very simple fast. So he was still eating normal foods so to say, but he wasn't eating a large amount of them and he wasn't eating foods that were known to have a lot of sugars and fats and things like that. So those are three things that if you want to check those out further, a lot of people have had results with intermittent fasting. They've had results with just transitions gradually, like just cutting it down as you go throughout the weeks. And some people like myself, like my friend Shakira, for the most part, we try to eat like Daniel did all the time. There might be 5% of the time when we don't, but the rest of the time we do, and we've experienced phenomenal results that way. So question as we close here is, how does the original diet best benefit us? And then number two, what are some practical tips that you utilize in your own lives? So number one, how does the original diet best benefit us? Would anyone like to share? I think it will make us a lot healthier. I think our bodies could be a whole lot healthier. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, um, I'm not sure if I had your name right. Is it Shonda? Oh, Sanja. How do you spell that if you don't mind? S-O-N-J-A. Oh, Sanja. Okay. Thank you, Sanja. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree yeah. with you. One thing we haven't really emphasized, even though we are cutting back, we need to drink more water. Mm -hmm. Water needs to be taken in even if you're fasting. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent, we're going to have a whole Bible study on that in two weeks on the importance of water, but I'm glad right. you brought it up tonight. Yeah, don't fast without water unless God calls you to, but most likely he's not going to do that. <laughs> you're right. And what kind of tips do you guys have? Because for some of us, we've been living this out for a while. And for some of us, this might be brand new. So what are some tips or something that you'd like to share with the group? Like what's an easy way to start eating healthy? Uh, yeah, yeah, personal, oh, yes. Personally, I, 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 we started, I started a fast last, um, was it January or February, I think it was for 40 something days. 
and um, uh, I gave up uh, sweets and I gave up um, meat. And uh, then when it was when the fast was over, I just continued it, and I've I've lost sixty pounds since then. <laughs> So uh, it's definitely improved my life. I, I instead of eating rice, I eat key, mostly quino. The I, I the, um, uh, the whole thing about the gut, uh, the the bacteria in your gut. I'm very well aware of all the in the, the, the nutritional yeast. There's so many, and then there then we can get into a whole big thing on supplements <laughs> nutritional supplements are very very important because there's a lot of things we don't get from food especially if it's a plant-based diet that we don't get enough of so there's a lot of other things we need you know that i, I i've learned over the course of the uh, the last nine months uh that i've been implementing into my daily practice you know wow praise god like that's incredible like what you've done, like just all those changes you've made and you're sticking with it and you oh God, really the glory. I mean, us. really, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, yeah, it was, it, it, it all, it, it all came together on Martin Luther King's birthday, which was really interesting. He just, <laughs> so, um, so what would you say, like, like what advice would you give to someone like what do you think is like a good way to start did was it making the decision that was the hardest or do you think it's best to start with a fast like what do you think is a good tip for someone who just wants to make some changes well for well we we, we did it as a group it was a, the church that I, that I i've been part of for the last 30 years they they're in new jersey and we go during zoom meetings once a week but um uh, uh, you know, we 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 started we started on a fast, and and every every day we were supposed to uh study something about in the Bible that we were unfamiliar with. So every day I I picked you know I had the Holy Spirit I asked the Holy Spirit well what what am I going to study today? And then I would do a whole you know I'd get on YouTube and I'd study for eight hours literally uh, uh of everything i could find out about that subject and then write it down and then actually uh you know you know uh you know take notes and uh and I, then the next day i would do that and i did that for 40 something days and by the time i was done i was so much so filled with information <laughs> it was unbelievable i had all this revelation and stuff from god just through his word you know what i mean i was just getting it just from the basically from the bible you know wow. because i mean it was coming from the you know youtube but i mean it was all god's word it was all coming straight from the bible you know oh oh i'm happy for you like as you're getting excited i'm getting excited for you like that's amazing how god's working in your life yeah well see before that see i i I, I've I've been talking to God all my life. Well, actually, He's been talking to me all my life. I'm actually in the process of writing a book called "He's Been There All the Time." Mm -hmm. And um, when I was when I even when I was a young child, from like nine years old, and I give well, you'll you'll when when the book comes out, you'll see it. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, God made His presence known to me at an early age, and. I I always thought it was uh, I was crazy. As a matter of fact, I was on Social Security disability because they because I told them that I was hearing voices and I was I was hearing uh, God's voice and I was hearing the voice of the devil. <laughs> and they put me on Social Security disability for twenty five years because of that. Can you imagine this? All right. Uh, anyway, so so it wasn't until uh, Martin Luther King's birthday. That all of a sudden, I I and I started talking back. You know, I, mean? I in other words, I I recognized God's voice that was different than Satan's voice, obviously, or the voice of the world, or the voice of the flesh, in you know, my own flesh, and uh, I was able to start to having conversations with this with the spirit that was talking to me for the for the, for the past 50 years <laughs> so so uh, it, you know it it totally gave a paradigm shift in my head to where i was to where i am now you know so it's not, not that i 
not that I I I have like um uh, great revelations or anything like that, but it you know and not that I, he answers or I or I get answers to every single question. There's still a lot that you know he, like uh, he's silent about. You know, <laughs> just like recently I had a a pet die and I was like I felt very discouraged after the pet died and it was because I pray for the pet every day. You know what I mean? And I'm saying like. Well, you know, you know, that was my biggest uh, uh, prayer was for myself, because most of the time I don't pray for myself. I pray for other people, but for, for, for my own family, you mostly pray for my, my cats. And uh, when, 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 when the cat died, uh, I felt like kind of like betrayed in a way, but I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't go to God and say to him, well, why did you do this? Because I, well, who am I to? To, you know to argue what why why God let this happen you know what I mean and you know, my other pastor told me you know the devil took my cat but I don't know how to take that you know I'm, I'm still in the process of processing this so you know that's just the you know, uh, you know I like I said I, I'm not getting all the answers I don't you know I'm not talking to God on like like I'm talking to you people right now I wish it was more that way but it's getting better every day you know the more i time that the, the whole thing is the time the more time you put in talking to god the more he's going to talk back <laughs> so it's all about time you spend with jesus the time you spend with god time you spend in his word you know what i mean it's you know if you do it for you know if you if you do it for five minutes you're going to get five minutes worth of uh worth out of it if you do it for an hour you get an hour worth of worth we got 24 hours in a day so you know he, he, you know he he would like us to communicate with him you know uh, you know to, to, as much as possible you know what i mean um that's uh, uh the, I, my biggest prayer that i uh, that that i i that i that i know jesus and the power of his resurrection you know what i mean that's my my goal here to be like Jesus, to be Christ like in Amen. every area of my life, to be like Him. You know what I mean? And and I see myself. You know, the more you do this, believe me, you when you start you start praying like this, and you see all the stuff you're doing wrong, <laughs> and it's like whoa. <laughs> but you know, you gotta you gotta like you know you know just you know just ask forgiveness and just move on. You know what I mean? And just take it one little step at a time. We got something to help you move on, Rick. Right here. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, look at that. Oh, don't, please don't show me that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a cutie. We're, I we just, uh, three three kittens and the, we just had the mother spade. Yeah. So we have uh, three little kittens about got six weeks old. Feisty little boy here. <laughs> yes. Oh, you need a daddy. Say, I need a daddy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Jeff, a couple months ago, uh, there was a yellow cat that showed up on Caddyshack. And, yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, somebody adopted that fairly quickly because yes. it was so beautiful. Yes. So I'm thinking it was the same one you showed up. Yeah, it was. red. Her name was Red. Yeah, it's kind of a, a yellow cat. Yeah, color. yeah. Name yeah. was, was red. red. Yeah, he named it Piper. We understand. Yeah, and she's on Instagram. We hear. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, was in love with it. It was a well-loved cat. Quickly, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, was. we hope these three go to good homes yeah. too. Anybody need well, a kid? Yeah. Yeah. I can't have that chair. No. Uh, Come on. Put him I'm away, at least. Well, I can. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. Yeah. Not fair. Just anyway well, thank you everyone for coming out thank you. Um, next week we'll get into a practical one on exercise and then brendan brought up a good point about water so the following week will be on water um this week if it seemed rushed i apologize nutrition you could cover like 10 weeks just on nutrition alone so we just tried to hit the highlights uh, but next week will be exercise it'll be like a little bit slower paced because um, exercise there is a lot but not as much as on nutrition and we hope you come back out for that if you would like to share how you exercise what you have some practical tips i'm sure that would benefit the rest of the group as well okay. Ashley, uh, yes. Ashley, i would like to share that 
The aspartame that you mentioned earlier uh, causes uh, neurogenic uh, problems with our brain. And so uh, look on all your labels because they're using more aspartame, A-S-P-E-R-T-A-N-E, today than ever before. And yep. uh, there are some that uh, sugar sweeteners that are health, much healthier, but avoid the aspartame because it causes a lot of neurological okay. problems. Yeah, definitely. You know. Hey, man, I, I actually have written an article on food additives. I'll, I'll send it to you, actually. Oh, yes, please do. Please. Hey, man. Great point, Elaine. Thank you. So if you guys don't mind, I'm just going to close in prayer, and then I wanted to make sure we have each other's emails. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the privilege of coming together. Thank you for like-minded people. Thank you so much for the miraculous ways you've worked in each one of our lives and the difference that healthy eating has made. And I ask that you just please be with us this New Year's. You know, we're mortals, we're sinners, so there's room for improvement for all of us. We want to be holy, Lord. So please sanctify us through our diets. Let us give you the honor. Let us give you the glory. And please especially be with Rick, you know, as his pet passed away. We know what that's like, and we know the grief that comes with that. So please be especially with him. Please bless his walk with you and bless each and every one of our walks with you. In your precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen.